Hi, this is Pat McDonald, your host for Vote for Vermont, where our tagline is listening beyond the sound bites. Joining me today is Eric LaMontagne, who is Executive Director for Campaign for Vermont and our guest host this evening. Happy okay. to be here. And I need to say that this is a series of uh, interviews that we're doing. Um, and any candidate from any party or independent can call us up or contact us at um, voteforvermont at gmail.com and ask to be on the show and we'll get you on. So and our candidate this evening I'm very honored to meet is Lauren Zupan, who's a Republican running for U.S. Senate. How nice are you? Fine, Pat. U.S. Senate. Nice to be very here. Nice. Thank, Thank you. you. I'm glad we could work this out. Sure, I appreciate it. You live far away down south in Manchester, right? In Manchester, yeah, yes. the tropics, right. Yes, exactly. <laughs> Below Route 4, that's what they talk about. Um, you have an amazing background, and I would love you to spend some time talking about all of that, and I think our viewers would love to hear it. Thank you. Well, um, I grew up in a family that was very political and very uh, plugged into what works and what doesn't work in the, in the economy according to their understanding. Um, so even from the age of eight or nine, my uh, beloved father of blessed memory would took me aside and taught me his point of view about how the political and economic system ought to be. Now I love my father and I love his memory, but his point of view was socialism. Ah. So it was great because I got an in-depth understanding of the rationale for socialism in those people who are of good conscience, who really believe that it is the solution for our socioeconomic system. And being eight, nine, ten years old and hearing from my beloved father, whom I revered, um, you know, I thought that, you know, that made sense. Um, and of course, then as I got older and uh, graduated from college and I became the director of a nonprofit, I began to understand a little bit about how things worked. But then when I went to graduate school and studied economics uh, as an MBA and also opened my own small business, I really got an in-depth understanding of what makes things work. And I also, as I grew up, I understood more about human nature. Now, human nature includes the desire to move forward, to excel, to do things, and to receive the fruit of your labor. And the more positive reinforcement you get of your behavior, okay. meaning getting paid for your work, the more work you'll do. And frankly, the less payment for your efforts you get, you know, the lazier you become. And that's not a slight of any individual, that's just the way people are, and it's perfectly natural. So why has the United States fed, housed, clothed, protected, in security, more people than any other country in the history of the world because we've unleashed that simple secret of giving the individual the maximum opportunity to rise as high as his mm -hmm. talent and ability and effort will let him go. And we are now in danger of reversing that whole approach to what has always made America the most wonderful and envied country in the world. Yep. All the time I was growing up, I knew that America was just a model for other countries and the envy of the world. And you know what I'm reminded of when I look at Senator Sanders, with all due respect to the venerable senator, I'm reminded of the 1929 Rose Bowl. In the 1929 Rose Bowl, there was a man called Wrongway Harrigan. Oh, right. And he got the ball and he ran with great vigor and conviction right into the wrong end zone right. and scored right. for the opposition. And I'm afraid that our Senator Sanders is the wrong way Harrigan of American politics because he's taken the ball called the American economy and political discourse and running right into the wrong end zone. I myself would like to receive the punt from Senator Sanders and run the right direction for a touchdown. And what does that touchdown look like? That touchdown is really not that complicated. The touchdown is allowing people to understand and receive the fruits of their efforts to work hard and to not have any undue restrictions and taxation put on them. As our own Calvin Coolidge said, any taxation beyond what is absolutely necessary is legal theft. But I'm sorry I diverged because no, you were ahead. asking me about my background. Yeah, <laughs> and so I went from the story of my father but, you know, it's a sweet story because 25 years later, after he got done teaching me about socialism, he's sitting in my office 
And at this time, I had my own small company. I was paying salaries and health care for five young professionals. I was making a profit and I was paying taxes and I was growing a new business that never existed before and I was explaining to my father how all of this worked and he listened in rapt attention. He said to me, hey, you know, you've taught me more about how your creative right. capitalism works in 30 minutes than I've known in my whole life. Mm, interesting. So from that business, which was a food import business, which I learned a lot, I learned about the interdependence of, of trade between nations. Why? Because ironically, in 1980, and you know we had the former peanut farmer president, uh, oh, Jimmy Carter. Carter right? Ironically, in that last year of his presidency, there was a peanut drought in the southeast. Now, why mm. was that significant? Because peanuts are a very important crop for snacks and peanut butter in our country. So the embargo or limit on foreign peanuts coming in President Jimmy Carter, of all people, had to lift that embargo. Hmm. What did that mean to our little company? My associate was in China at the tr agricultural fair at the time, and I immediately telexed him, and of course, in 1980, telex was state-of-the-art communication. <laughs> oh, it was very cool. Yeah, right. so you had a telex right. machine, you were top of the heap. And I said, buy, buy, buy. And within 72 hours, we had sold massive amounts of peanuts to the largest peanut users wow. like Planters and Anheuser-Busch. Right. It was like David selling slings to Goliath. It was really <laughs> fun. So what did I learn from that? I learned, first of all, to be alert to opportunity and to pounce or capitalize right. on when you have a good opportunity. And we filled a need because it was beautiful the way it worked. Because these companies were dying. Wow, they can't make peanut butter. You know, when planters can't make peanut butter, it's, you know, that's, that's like serious. Niagara Falls without water. <laughs> right, Come on. Right. So we filled the need to get them the product they needed to continue their commerce. We sold product that the Chinese agricultural uh, agencies needed to sell. Mm -hmm. And we did not go broke in the process, I, I can promise not. you. Right. And so it was an object lesson in international trade. So that was one great thing. but. Mm. Some of the best stories of my whole life, though, were when I went to work for the famous artist Peter Max, who was a lifetime friend. Oh, wow. And I was his business manager and director of special projects. So one day, um, we found ourselves um, on the South Lawn of the White House with President George Herbert Walker Bush mm -hmm. for announcing his Thousand Points of Light program. Oh, I remember that. Okay, so we had the honor of our artist did a four by eight mural of the American flag with a heart painted into it to symbolize the thousand points of light. Uh. So, um, but the best part of it was not that. The best part of it was taking that painting, not long after that, in 1991, and bringing it to what was still called Leningrad, which is now St. Petersburg again. Mm -hmm. We arranged to sort of break the uh, cultural barrier to get into the Soviet Union with a Peter Max artistic exhibition. Mm. So now, picture this. Picture this four by eight American flag in all of its robust exuberance, because right. our flag is exuberant, perched on the steps mm. in St. Isaac Square in Leningrad, which, listen to me now, is the exact same location where Vladimir Lenin sparked the Russian Revolution. So for me to well, bring I'm that flag surprised. there was sort of a, take that Vladimir moment, <laughs> you know what I mean? Right. And, but, and it got even better though, because then around the corner in this old gray but capacious museum, we had lines around the block to come and see the American mm -hmm. artist. And all the people were huddled against the cold and they all went, sort of looked like gray yeah. clay yeah. people, in kerchiefs, and they all lined up and inside uh, a TV interview I had a microphone in front of this little old lady's face and she had a kerchief and she was all huddled. And the interviewer said to the lady, why are there tears coming down your face? And the lady said, because I never even knew there were colors like this in the world. Oh my goodness. And I'm standing there listening to this. And for me, I learned two things in that precious moment. First of all, it was a moment of gladness and triumph that we brought a colorful, unapologetically right. American exhibit right. into the Soviet Union and that the Soviet citizens were getting to see the joy and exuberance of America through the art 
Huh. And so I was getting to enjoy that triumphal moment. And it reconfirmed to me the exceptionalism of America, which I'm not apologizing for. Good. We don't like people who apologize. <laughs> and then at the same time, it confirmed to me that the Soviet system, the Union of Soviet Socialist Republics, the so socialist system brings nothing but misery, scarcity, and lack to the people right. of, that, it, uh, that are unfortunate enough to live under it. Right. You know, you're talking about your dad, and, and he was believing in socialism. And, mm -hmm. and what did he look to as an example? Because now when you talk about Venezuela, and all, I mean, it doesn't seem to work. You know, um, you may have noticed in life that when a person sets their vision and belief system on something, they are, have an uncanny ability to screen out right. countervailing right. evidence that dissuades them from their previously held beliefs. That's unfortunate. Right. I myself have tried all my life to force, f fight against that tendency. And that's why I've had to make a lot of dramatic changes in my life, none of which I'm regretting. Yeah. But uh, my father, you see, my father was a labor union socialist. And he grew up in an era which basically right. taught him that the laborer was exploited by the boss yeah, right. and you had to do anything you could to b overbalance back against that boss. Now, um, there's another thing, there's, a, there's an important piece that my father never experienced and that was the risk capital that went into the business that enabled there to even be a boss or to be jobs for the laborer. Because what is risk capital? Risk capital is the money that an entrepreneur puts into a business in order to produce and create a business okay. that never existed before. Now, think about where that risk capital comes from. The risk capital is the crystallized fruit of effort and work previously undertaken, which has yielded that money so that person even has the capital to put at right. risk. Right. So why should we disdain those who have accumulated a certain amount of money that they can utilize to produce more good services and new industry that never existed before. In fact, we should champion them. And that's what I intend to do should I have the privilege of serving the people of Vermont in the U.S. Senate. I will be championing every day the risks and the entrepreneurial thrust and love of the challenge that Americans have always risen up to and have succeeded or failed but move forward in the process providing innumerable jobs and opportunities that wouldn't have existed had they not stepped forward. I so hope you get to um, debate Bernie. <laughs> that was great. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Thank, Thank you. you. Can you you have asked him, right? I saw it on well, we have, Facebook. We have, You've asked him to to Yeah, um, he of, he has so far the grudgingly conceded two dates towards the very end of the election cycle. Oh. And we are promoting very vigorously that he would meet early and several times. Oh great. Because there's a lot to oh. talk about. Yes, for sure. Whoa, I don't want to miss that. We'll be there. <laughs> so yeah, I guess that's a, a good segue. You've chosen this incumbent battle, which is, you know, there's a long history of the people voting for the incumbent, and especially in Vermont when you have such a cemented, uh, visible character, visible opponent such as Bernie Sanders. So why have you chosen this battle, and, and why have you chosen to do it in Vermont? Well, I think you, one of the words you chose is the cue and the, uh, and the foundation for part of the answer, the cement. The cement or the kind of rigor mortis of the socialist approach, which in all of uh, Senator Sanders' 27 years in Congress, is it 27, 37 years in Congress, has produced no major legislation, no forward motion for the people of Vermont. It has produced some noteworthy forward motion for Senator Sanders' career as he used the, stepping, the Vermont as the stepping stone to, uh, for his national ambitions, which he continues to do this day. But the journalists of Vermont, the voters and the citizens and the farmers and the veterans of Vermont deserve and demand his presence and attention on this state more than his presence and attention in Iowa and California. Now, I've offered, if he's too busy to come back to Vermont to debate me, I'll fly to Iowa and California, Whoa. wherever he is. Can't say no to that. I'll debate him wherever he can 
managed to spare a little time, but I think the people of Vermont would much prefer that he comes back home to debate his challenger. And here's from me what I think he could, should be doing differently, and what I will be doing differently for the people of Vermont should I be given the privilege. That's great. Well, you must let us know the, we'll, we'll be glad to promote those dates for you when you get them. Thank you. So um, I just want to skip back a little bit to the, when we're, you were talking about socialism. When I read about all the things you have to say, you talked about, I have a special place in my heart for Switzerland, so you talked about the canton of Zug. Yeah. And could you talk a little bit about, um, about that canton sure. and how they have successfully put in some of these economic principles, and you say that Vermont could be like Zug. No, I say That's Vermont can do better than better Zug. Better than Zug even better. And I'll tell you why. First of all, because we have the privilege of living and ha being a state encompassed within the United States of America. That gives us a huge advantage from day one. But it's interesting because Zug in Switzerland, you know, Switzerland has a similar type of natural beauty to Vermont, so there's a certain type of uh, concordance to comparing the two situations, but it's really about economics and economic principles and what works to drive an economy forward. What you're talking about is during a six-year period, the canton of Zug did, did a, an experiment, lowered their maximum personal income tax rate to 22.9, the maximum corporate tax rate to 15.9. Mm. And what happened as a result in the six-year period that was measured they had a 30% increase in the number of companies, a 20% increase in the number of people um, uh, coming in to be employed. They had a 1.9% unemployment rate driven down, a 0.3% residential vacancy rate. New stores, new businesses sprung up. Right. The place was and is an experiment in vitality. Wow. So the question is, why can't Vermont be like the canton of Zug? and even better. I'll tell you the answer to both questions right now. It can be at least as good by following those policies, by lowering the level of taxation, because what you tax tends to shrink. You know, when you tax people who prosper and, and are productive, first of all, you lower their incentive to continue to be productive. Secondly, you're giving them an engraved invitation to move somewhere else. Right. Because what you tax shrinks, what you allow to prosper grows. I mean, this is common sense mm -hmm. for everybody except socialists, who seem to put common sense aside in the interest of their uh, rigor mortis ideology of what they think is going to serve people, right. or maybe they don't even really care. I'm not sure about that. Mm -hmm. So why can Vermont be better than Zug? Here's why. Because right now it's 2018, and in the next six to 18 months, the entire United States of America is going to experience a radical opportunity of ubiquitous or everywhere satellites conveying down onto the country. Broadband, wide pipe broadband, 100 times better than what we get right now right. for internet and for cell phone service. And if I am elected senator, the thing I'll be lobbying for primarily will be to make sure that the early satellites are directly over and servicing right. the villages and towns and hamlets of Vermont. Why is that important and what will happen? You'll, you've noticed that there have been times in our economic history where the echo niche or the uh, economic culture of a town dissipates, a con uh, uh, an industry goes down, right. a company right. moves out, the whole economy shrivels up. Now the reverse also works. You take one little hamlet of 450 people, which we have so many of, and you put one successful business there with six, eight people who are all making good living. And now the rippling, the happy ripples right. of economic right. vitality move outward. And all the businesses that dried up come back to life and new ones come because right. they need the same goods and services people need everywhere. This is music to the last mile people, right? The last mile people. <laughs> It'll finally be resolved. You know, but we don't have to dig up every street in order right. to get cable. We don't have to tax the government's coffers and raise taxes on everybody else in order to provide digital justice, as they might call right. it, to everybody? Yeah, nice. No. The, same, the solution that's going to work is the same solution that works best all the time. 
the companies that the five companies that are competing to put these satellites up right. are doing it out of enlightened self-interest right. because they will make a lot of money doing it and they have the wherewithal and the interest to do it. And by the way, when that hundred times wide digital pipeline comes down in Vermont, it's going to be for pennies on the dollar. I know that people are really going to be sad not to send two hundred dollars to Comcast every month, <laughs> but they'll get over it. They'll get over it. Oh my God, that's great. That is very good. So you you use this term, <clears throat> excuse me, um, opportunity economy. Yeah, I like that. Walk us through what that means and, and what are some of your more specific ideas for accomplishing that. Well, part of what we've already touched on relates to your question, the opportunity economy. See, we are living in the most significant technologically advanced opportunity since ink was first placed on scroll some thousands of years ago. That was revolutionary when people first realized that they could record their thoughts, experiences, memories, ideas, inventions, and pass them on and circulate them by reducing them to paper. We take it for granted, but it used to be revolutionary when it first happened. Now we have the digital age where the sum total of medical knowledge, just to use one example, doubles every 73 days. Mm. Think about that. That's because of the tremendous proliferation and availability of the world's knowledge at our fingertips. If somebody told me when I was growing up that someday I could have this little gadget in my hand that could access a significant percentage of all the world's the accumulation of the world's knowledge, I would have said, come on, how's that possible? Yet, most school kids have that right now. So the enablements and the possibilities, I mean, the genome, for example, mm -hmm. which is the map of every of the DNA in a human body. The first genome took a billion dollars and ten years of research to produce. Now you can have a genome of an individual body for between one and two hundred dollars and soon mm -hmm. it'll be less than the cost wow. of your morning shower. And what does that mean? And how does that translate into the welfare of humans and the advancement of all that's good and great and noble? Because by having that kind of a map of a human body, the ability to diagnose, to treat, to come up with new research solutions for medical ailments, just expands, mm -hmm. uh, it just proliferates geometrically. Right. It's right. just beyond our ability to necessarily grasp sitting here. Mm. And this is so exciting for the people coming, going through college and high school and learning these days. The opportunities for advancement and research and study are just mind boggling. It's so exciting. Uh, what a time to be a young person. Mm -hmm. And this can all be done. And the young people do not have to go to Austin, Texas, New York City, mm -hmm. Silicon Valley anymore when we have ubiquitous broadband right. internet. They can stay right here and do their research. They can stay right here and start their new businesses. Right. They can stay right here and prosper. So the exodus from Vermont, which we've painfully observed in recent weeks, years, months, mm -hmm. will be reversed. People will not want to leave because we already have the most beautiful state. If we can have the most, the most uh, economically viable, or at least as viable as anywhere else, state, why would people want to leave en masse? No, on the contrary, we will start to attract some of the best and brightest. Mm. And we will have new wonderful things here in Vermont. And this is what I want to promote and encourage right. and do what I can to foster. Now, a senator has to do two things. He has to take actions to foster the types of things I'm talking about. Mm. But the other thing is harder and easier at the same time. He has to sometimes do nothing. In other words, encourage the government to stay out, out of the of way right. of progress. Right. Exactly. So, That's you know, a hard lesson for those folks. It is. It's one that I've learned, though, by seeing when government has interfered with my economic life in a mm. way that was neither healthy or justified and uh, it cost me money and didn't do the government any good um, except to give them the satisfaction of knowing that they could push an individual around by the power of government. Which as you know if you think about it, the power of government is ultimately reduced to the power of a gun. Because if you don't follow the laws, you get fined. Right. If you don't pay the fine, uh, you are picked up by uh, the, the gendarmes who will take you right. at the force uh, at the risk of force of violence right. to jail. Right. So that's government. Government is brute force. 
So we want to use government, the brute force of government, selectively and always in the best interests of the public. Sometimes it's necessary to protect the mm -hmm. public, which is very legitimate. But it needs to not be abused and it needs to be uh, utilized very delicately because we humans in America are a land where we have a document that for the first time in human history enshrined individual rights above governmental rights. Right. We who've grown up here and who are, are fortunate enough to know that right. may have taken it for granted long ago, but until the U.S. Constitution was enacted, which restricts government from stamp, tramp, stampeding and trampling on the rights right. of individuals, this was not the norm. This was the first American Revolution and frankly, with all due respect to Senator Sanders, is the only American revolution we needed or will ever need. <laughs> right. So, uh, Senator right. Sanders, I don't know what you have in mind with your second revolution, but I su suggest that you pay more attention to the glory of the first one, if you're listening. Right. I was very glad to see how much you did talk about the Constitution in all of your, you know, in all of your postings, because I think our, our young people don't know much about that document. I mean, some of us who have been around a little while know it and appreciate it for what it is. Yes. And well, were they smart to put that together? They've thought of just about everything. Uh, they're brilliant. Yeah. They're brilliant. You know, Madison, Washington, yeah. Adams, Franklin. These men were giants, and I right. believe that they were placed in the right place at the right, right. time um, so that generations of people would be able to benefit right. by what they put we together. We just have to get the young people to understand the value of that document. Well, it would be I good if we, lost. we still taught it in our schools yeah. um, and revered it as it desi deserves to be right. revered. Right. Um, so I think. Well, thank you for I mean, I just, I thought, it was, oh, there it is. There's the Constitution discussion. It doesn't happen very often. Yeah. You know? So I, I wanted to just talk a little bit about the reality of where, we're, where we are these days and your assessment of the current Congress and perhaps the last year or so in Congress and, and how they're working and, and producing or not producing work, what, what's your feeling about them? Well, you know, the cautionary note is to bring to mind the uh, uh, sort of darkly uh, humorous uh, proverb about one who has a weak stomach not watching how either laws or sausages oh, are yes, made. exactly. So uh, with that as a proviso, um, I think the most important thing that every lawmaker has to do, and if I have the privilege of being elected, I'm going to probably write it on my wall where I see it when I wake up in the morning, is to remember that a lawmaker, be they a member of Congress or the Senate, has a sacred trust, and they even swear an oath, yeah. a sacred trust to fight for, preserve, and perform actions in accordance with the charter of our country in order to enable the fairest and just, most just uh, enactment of what the country was founded to make available to all Americans. If, uh, if there was a, a spreading little contagion among lawmakers, a happy contagion of selflessness mm. uh, and, and where one could see that the other one was really acting on the basis of constitutional principle, I think it would spread like a really pleasant virus from one member of Congress to the other. Now, I don't mean to be too Pollyannish and forget that people are people with their own foibles and, um, and the pressures that come with needing to do compromises and swap, pro swap favors, so to speak, right. to get things done. But I think that kind of contagion starts with one senator or congressman going in and swearing before whatever is holy to them that they will not transgress the purpose for which the people of their state well, send them there. I just saw such a difference in their, oh, I don't know what the word is, but their conduct when they were um, interviewing uh, Secretary DeVos, when they were certainly interviewing um, uh, Kavanaugh, of mm -hmm. the, and it's just this vicious vitriol of, mm. I'm like, what are you doing? I mean, you can mm. ask the same questions and get to the same results in a little more respectful way. And I think we've sort of lost a, a, a lot this year. Um, yeah. I, I know it's for the greater good and whatever you think of Kavanaugh or not, and, but it's still uh, respect and, 
and you can you don't have to be that nasty to get your point across. I, I, I was appalled when I was watching that. I mm. thought, please bring it back to the way it used to be. Yeah, civility mm. yeah, um, goes a long word. way, and um, it should be restored. Yeah, really, it's it's gone. I don't know if we we'll get it back, but I sure hope that 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 person you're talking about who sets the example and and gets people to go, hey, maybe there is a better way. You know, the person who is true to their oath, um, even if nobody else in the world noticed, he will have accomplished something great, exactly. or she. Right, thank you. But the likelihood is that it will be noticed, and it will spread. Yeah, I hope so, you're right. Because so, the opposite works, we've seen that. No, it's terrible. So nationally, we've been seeing this more and more, this seeming disdain that's growing in terms of party politics uh, and people blaming party politics on the current basic, you know, what seems like stagnation in our ability to accomplish anything either by the state level or even at a federal level. Could you speak to your perspective on, on party politics and how that might play a role into where we are? Yes, if, if a legislator has the attitude and the commitment to seek the best solution for every piece of legislation or every issue, or every problem, regardless of where that solution or legislation emanated, from where it emanated, but looks for the best thing for the people, uh, for his constituents or her constituents, then I think we will go a long way to solving the problem. Uh, there is an unfortunate um, herd mentality in each party where each party feels they need to um, corral uh, mono, monomaniacal cooperation with the party line. Um, and um, I, for one, am not in favor of that. I do believe that people belong to a certain party or another because there are ideological uh, and pragmatic reasons for it that ought to be honored. But ultimately, the legislator's responsibility is not to party first. Mm -hmm. The legislator's responsibility is to the constituents, right. the voters, the citizens, the taxpayers, mm -hmm. first and foremost. And he or she has to stand on that principle, even if it means getting voted out of office, even if it means not getting the financial support from the party heads. Because if you sell out your, that principle, then you have just become another faceless, unidentifiable member of a mass of previous self-interested right. uh, um, politicians that have gone by and will always be happily forgotten. And, and maybe that's a good transition into starting to talk about some of those, those issues and where you stand on some of these more specific um, issues. We have a few written down here that may, Pat and I can maybe take turns and... Um, yeah, because I think when, if, if you are fortunate enough to be elected, They've left a lot of stuff on the table. Hmm. They've talked a lot, but they haven't done much, right. I think, on some of these issues. And obviously, the, the first one is immigration, which mm -hmm. is um, mm -hmm. every day, I think. Well, the first and most important thing that needs to be reminded uh, in every discussion about immigration is that immigration has played an important role in the formulation of who we are. Um, hmm. Now, I'm not going to say we're a nation of immigrants. We're a nation of citizens who may have one time f had forebears who were immigrants right. who wonderfully assimilated into this beautiful tapestry called America. But immigration is uh, a treasured component of what it means to be the United States of America. There's a great difference, and it has been deliberately blurred, obfuscated, and pretended as if it doesn't exist between legal immigration mm -hmm and illegal immigration. The two don't even belong in the same conversation. A nation that doesn't have laws is not a nation. A nation that doesn't have geographic boundaries ceases to exist and does not exist. It's interesting that those who mo are most vociferous in their demands to eliminate those forces that patrol and control our boundaries are as equally oblivious on the other side of the fact that there isn't another country in the world that does not control its borders, right. including the one to our immediate south, 
with its border with Guatemala, exactly. for example. They actually have a wall, right? They do, <laughs> and it's, they have armed guards on it. So, you know, uh, the hypocrisy and the deliberate, the willful uh, blinding of oneself to the obvious um, is dishonest and destructive. Now, that doesn't mean that we don't have a complex problem that still has elude, eluded uh, a good solution to the current migration crisis where people are crashing our border in unprecedented numbers and we don't have a constructive, humane, and legal way to deal with them. This has to be formulated by people in Congress who also understand that a nation that doesn't have borders is not a nation, but that um, treating people who have broken the laws does not mean that they are completely disposable human beings. So it's very <laughs> difficult, but um, the fact is is that if somebody crashes to our border, they're already a criminal. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry to say. Mm -hmm. They're already a criminal. So what do we owe them? Do we owe them driver's licenses, food, housing, clothing, education, and health care paid for by the legal citizens who've been paying taxes all their lives? I don't think so. I think we owe them <laughs> Uh, a humanitarian uh, treatment and in many cases a return to their nation of origin and an invitation to apply uh, legally through the immigration system. I mean when I was a young man one of the uh, tasks I was given was to handle the immigration into our country of oh. a very exalted VIP and I got to experience firsthand what it took to gain someone legal Right. entrance into the country, what's called a green card, legal residence, and a path to citizenship. And, you know, it was very demanding, but it was the law, and we went through it step by step, and we succeeded. Now, he, as a legal entrant, an applicant, to have the privilege of re residing in our country and attaining citizenship, while all these people who crash through illegally should be given special privileges, Right. I don't understand. What, what is driving that? What What is the, for those who um, support open borders, what are they hoping to get out of it? There must be something for them in this. It's not really all about votes, is it? Mm. Well, is that the sad, sad truth of it? Well, you know, um, it's always hard to assess the motivations of other people's actions. On the other hand, you can judge what their motivations might be by looking what the likely results will be of the actions they take. So for example, the open borders people, the result of their actions, if followed to the illogical conclusion, would be that we don't have a country anymore. So what that uh -huh. means is maybe these are people who really hate America and want to see it dissolved in a pile of ruin. And, uh, or maybe it's something a little less uh, malevolent, just merely getting all these people in and being the party that brings them in and tries to validate and give euphemisms like undocumented workers That's rather right. than illegal immigrants, which is really what they are, right. are looking to pad the roles of the voters in their party. I'm sure there's some of that. But whatever their motivations are, people of good conscience who are responsible for the existence, welfare, and following the laws of the United States of America have to control the dialogue and have to insist that the laws of the United States of America be followed. Right. Period. Period. Exactly. Um, End of story. Talk to us a bit about uh, tariffs. It's in the news all the time these days about how we're adding a, a, a tariff for this commodity or that commodity. Right, right. Well, it's interesting. I told you my story earlier about importing peanuts. And the reason that we were able to import them was the tariff was list, lifted, and not only the tariff, but the restriction, the quota, very low floor quota, was lifted so that this commerce, new commerce, could come in. Now, it was lifted only because of a crisis situation in that industry. So, um, generally speaking, I'm not in favor of tariffs. Hmm. However, um, I'm also not in favor of walking around with a splint on my leg unless it's broken, in which case I'm happy to wear the splint until my leg is healed to the point where I don't need the splint anymore. 
I think what the current administration has tried to do is put a splint on the broken leg called trade imbalance where we have been right. taken advantage of, right. out negotiated by the Chinese, the European Union, the Russians, and the Iranians. And that the current administration has decided that the way to stop that and turn it around is to apply tariffs and at the very least to let them know that there's a different sheriff in town. Right. So as a permanent solution, I don't favor tariffs. As a way to put a splint on the leg until it heals, and the broken leg is called trade imbalances and poor treaties, trade treaties mm -hmm. previously negotiated, until that is restored, they may have a useful role. It's a delicate balance. Um, it, needs, it deserves and needs people who are experts focused on this issue alone to manage right. uh, the treaties and the tariff situation, and I'm sure we have those. Yeah. So I just read an article today that Cabot Cheese has been impacted now by the tariffs. I certainly couldn't go back and track why, but I think when you're, you need to know, like you said, put people on it that understand the ripple effect down to the Cabot Cheeses and is that good or not good? Right. Um, because that's certainly for Vermont that wouldn't be good if something happened to Cabot Cheese. No, uh, it's funny that you mentioned cabbage cheese. Yesterday I was at the um, Larson Farm in Wells, Vermont mm -hmm. with several other legislators. I shouldn't say other legislators because I'm only a <laughs> desire to be legislator, but um, other candidates and current legislators. And we got a very good education about um, how farming works right. and um, uh, what it means to be a farmer in Vermont in this day and age. Um, so uh, it was really eye-opening. And one of the things that came up that was very important and I'd really like to emphasize, because this, frankly, is another high note for Vermont. You know, so often in a news cycle, especially nowadays, what dominates the news is everything that's bad, a crisis, right. things going right. wrong, somebody did this wrong. I mean, it's, it's always been that way, but it's magnified so much. How about some good news? Here's the good news. 40 or 50 years ago, when Cabot cheese became the preeminently recognized greatest cheese in America, right. it stimulated a whole beginning to what's called the Vermont brand. Right. Now, right. the Vermont brand is a brand that's widely respected as artisan, choice, select, extra care type of food. And that brand is getting beginning to get more nicely utilized mm -hmm. and exploited appropriately by the farmers, and we were talking for That's a long great. time about right. that, about how the Larson Farm, which makes um, some wonderful organic gelato from their dairy cows that are grass-fed and produce wonderful milk, and they make raw milk, because they're right. licensed to do so, right. and they make this uh, amazing gelato, how this is a classical great. Vermont brand artisan product, right. and that what they need is Vermont marketing. They need experts at marketing to promote this already existing love for right. Vermont food products. Right. So this is something, this is an opportunity that has been tapped somewhat, but needs to be utilized and right. tapped and expanded and grown right. for the benefit of farmers, for the benefit of those who are, who use the farm products to develop products further it's to the next strong. stage. I agree with you, the Vermont brand. When we travel out of state, people, oh, you know, Vermont. Ben and Jerry's, oh, geez, oh, you know, yeah. it's great. It, and thank goodness they got rid of that added sugar thing on the maple syrup. Oh, what a Good relief. Grief. Yeah, really. I give kudos to our uh, attorney general. I think he really did a yeoman's work on that one. I don't even know where they were thinking of. Yeah. It's a natural byproduct of maple syrup. Hello. Right. Uh, I yeah. Sorry. <laughs> yeah. No, that was a good Seriously. stroke. Yeah, that was exactly. a good stroke. So I hate. To, well, I hate to bring this other one up. What are we doing on time? Um, let's skip to. Um, I was going to ask you about gun control, but I think we're going to skip over that one. It's a, such a hot issue here in Vermont. Um, but healthcare. I don't know what what they're doing now in healthcare. And I tell you the truth, I don't even know what they're doing here in Vermont. It's sort of like they moved on to immigration, and now that's what they're thinking about. And the heck with healthcare. I don't know what they're up to. Well, you know. There's so much to say about health care, but um, uh, Senator Sanders' notion. Oh, oh yes. Senator Sanders' notion that Medicare for all is even remotely feasible or remotely right. desirable needs to be turned upside down and looked at for the ridiculous farce that it is. The, uh, the government, with all due respect to the American government, 
which doesn't deserve nearly as much respect as the American people and the American citizens and the American workers and the American taxpayers. The American government that spent $3 billion to produce a health care website that didn't work or spent $3 billion to not produce the website. <laughs> now, we're going to put them in charge of the entire oh, yeah. health care system for 326 million Americans? No, that same government which actually has, did you know we have socialized medicine already in America? Did you know that? No. What? It's called the Veterans Administration. Oh, oh they do that well. That's socialized yeah. medicine. Yeah. They own the buildings, they hire the staff, huh, right. they uh, have a monopoly on where those patients, the veterans, can go, and they deliver the health care, and you have to come and take it as it is. Right. And for the 21 million vets, who uh, are chartered to go to the Veterans Administration for health care. I understand only nine million of them really want to bother to go there. Right. Um, they have not been able to deliver satisfactorily. Mm -hmm. They've been dying on waiting lists hundreds of days. And uh, Senator Sanders used to be uh, the chairman of the Veterans Affairs Committee. And uh, I'm told he did try to solve the problem by throwing money at it, which didn't work because if you throw money at a dysfunctional system, a, it just goes down the right. drain. There has to be, here's the, here's the solution for the Veterans Administration. It's the same solution that, it's the same type of solution that works for health care for all 326 million Americans. They need to give the Veterans Administration competition. Because right now, with all due respect to the, the, the dedicated doctors, nurses, and staff that do work right. in the VA, and I'm sure there are many, right. But the basic approach is you're a veteran, you come there, you take what we give you, and whether you like it or not, this is it. They need competition. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. They need the veterans to have a voucher. They need to be able to go right. to the Veterans Administration and place A, B, C, and D and say, show me why I should let you treat me. Not going on hands and knees, please right. heal me. Yeah, the no. stories are, uh, are just mind-boggling. No, it should be the free market competition and help. Look. Tomorrow morning, when you go to the supermarket and you go up the aisle, you'll notice 40 brands of breakfast cereal. Why? Because yeah. there's a free market in breakfast right. cereal. Why do we only have two, and mostly 94%, only one insurance carrier in the state of Vermont? We used to have them. They, yeah. hit, they hit the road. Well, yeah. we need to do what it takes to get, right. open the doors, right. to let as many as want to, deciding on their own profitably right. to come back right. here. So here's the way it should be, okay? Instead of, oh, I want health care, I, I have to take what either Blue Cross, Blue Shield, or MVP offer me, it should be like this. Say, make believe I'm the health care uh, patient. I'm the potential cu customer, consumer. And I'm looking to buy health care. Oh, Mr. Healthcare Provider, you want to sell me health care insurance? Come here, let me see your resume. <laughs> what, what do you want me to pay for deductible? How much is the premium? Well, thank you for coming in. Next. That's the way it should be. Right. The buyer should decide what he wants to buy instead of the government-controlled system forcing right. down the throats. Right. And that's what Medicare for All would be. Yeah. It would be rationing. It would be a $32 trillion boondoggle. Even Senator Sanders admits he'd have to raise five taxes to pay for half of it. And the other half, oh, well, I guess we'll just have to add right. $16 trillion Yeah, they had some the number of how much deficit. this was going to cost us. $32.6 trillion oh, over trillion. 10 years. That's the number. I trillion with a T. Trillion. For those who <laughs> never had to think about what a trillion is, because most of us don't, right. a trillion is a thousand billions. Let that sink in. A thousand billions. Boy. And a billion is a thousand millions, which, of course, is a thousand thousands. That's a lot That's of money. That's a lot of money. Mm, but we still... Oh my gosh, <laughs> just drives me crazy. Yeah, because we tried that. Of course, you were following here in Vermont. We tried to do the single payer and realized that uh, well, even the Democrat like Shumlin, people can't he, fit, can't afford it. He he recognized yeah. that a three billion dollar yeah. uh, tax raise spread across the population was a non-starter. Yeah, right. And you know, he recognized it. Yeah. Uh, I'm waiting for Senator Sanders to recognize it. Perhaps when he deigns to debate with me, I'll help him to understand it. But the people who are supporting them, the young people and stuff, they just almost hear free. I mean, they yeah. just, that's what they hear. And that's why the tagline of this show is listening beyond the sound bites. And my example is when they say free, you better start asking questions of where that money's really coming from. If my 
beloved mother who was very sharp in business and very sharp uh, negotiator and very sharp in knowing how things work, if she were alive, she'd say, as soon as you hear the word free, grab your wallet. <laughs> exactly, and run. That's what my mother would say. <laughs> Mom's right. Moms are always right. That's it. So um, I guess maybe without getting into um, you bring a lot of skills and education and stuff to the table. How would you compare what you bring to the table with uh, our senator? Well, um, my understanding is that until he was 40, uh, Senator Sanders didn't have much experience in the private sector or working for a right. living. Um, and ever since then, he has been on the public payroll. And even at that, he has never brought forth a significant piece of legislation, and only seven uh, did he sponsor that were enacted in the first place since 1991. Yeah, I don't think people rec realize that. Yeah. So um, in terms of work experience, now I'm sure he's done things I don't know about, but I'll tell you what I have done. Um, I had 10 or 12 different well-paying well -paying for a 12-year-old jobs <laughs> before I left high school, okay? I was a paper boy. I was an ice cream vendor. I worked as a bus boy. I did, I was a police athletic league counselor for kids in the East Bronx. I had, yeah. I knew what it took, and I admit, when I was an ice cream vendor, I did eat a lot of the profits. <laughs> but, you know, even that taught me something. Yeah, right. You're yeah. going to eat your profits, right. you'll go home full but broke. Right. So, okay, that's a good lesson to learn, too. So, um, and then, I, as I mentioned earlier, uh, after going to college, I became the director at 21 of a nonprofit yeah. educational yeah. organization. And I had a staff of 40 people before I was in my mid-20s. And I managed those people and directed the resources and the scheduling and the real estate acquisition and the fundraising and did everything that the director of a nonprofit does. Right. And then I had other jobs before I went back. I became an executive recruiter and I learned what it takes to uh, evaluate mm. a candidate for a job, place him in another job in another state and move him and his family and get paid a fee for it. That was full of all kinds of lessons. But then I went back to school for my MBA, and I got an in-depth understanding of microeconomics, macroeconomics, accounting, all of the international business, mm -hmm. uh, marketing, all the things that go into building a successful company and a successful country. And then I, had, then I got into the food industry. I was hired into that on the strength of the education and experience I'd had, and had the experiences I talked about in the peanut industry. Yeah, right. And um, for several years, I was a food importer and a wholesaler. Um, and after that, I had the wonderful opportunity to work for Peter Max for 10 years right. and work with President Bush, work with President Reagan's office, and also President Clinton. Oh. Yeah. Oh. In fact, I had a, one of my, well, my proudest experience was when I got to shake President Reagan's hand and say, God bless you, Mr. President. That was, oh, that was great. And he gave me that. Irish smile and head nod, that was his characteristic <laughs> trademark. But when uh, President Clinton, as a way to thank me and the artist who had done the inaugural posters for his first inauguration, invited us to the Oval Office, wow. you know, that was, that was an cool. awesome experience. Yeah. You know, that was an awesome I experience. I think I remember this painting very well because I was, you said that was in the early 90s, 90? The, 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 the flag with the heart? Flag yeah. With, yeah. Right. I'm, that's in my head somewhere. I think we've all seen that, have we not? I think, I think so. Many have. Yeah, I think. So, um, and then after that experience, then I decided to get into real estate development and I became a realtor and I'm a real estate broker here in right. Manchester, Vermont. Right. And I've done other things too, but. Well, we're certainly glad to meet you. We have about three minutes left on our wall clock there. What would you like to do from a summary perspective? I, um, not necessarily the stump speech, but the why should you vote for me? Well, I'm reminded of, uh, in, in trying to answer that question succinctly without re recapping everything I've said. Yeah, but no, I know. I will say this. Uh, a couple of months ago, there was an extraordinary experience in the international news. It was kind of just a snippet, but it was so instructional. The country of Venezuela had just re-elected, mm. in quotes, uh, right. uh, Prime Minister Maduro, President yeah. Maduro in Venezuela. Mm -hmm. Now here was the president of Venezuela. Now keep in mind, Venezuela has the largest proven oil reserves in the world, yeah, right. second to none, and used to have a burgeoning middle class. 
a healthy economy, turned socialist, and now here's the socialist, and now the uh, inflation is a thousand percent, the pesos devalued to barrel loads for a bu bucket of bread like mm -hmm. 1990, 1990 Germany. So here's the president, newly elected, re-elected president of Venezuela, being sworn in in the presidential palace, and his hand is up for the oath, and the lights go out oh. in oh. the presidential palace. This is beyond Whoa. embarrassing. Wow. The lights go out in the presidential palace and stay it out for 20 minutes. Whoa. This that wasn't good. is socialism yeah, at work. Right. The wealthiest oil reserve country in the world can't keep the lights on. So here's what I have to say to your viewers. If you favor me with the privilege of being the United States Senator from Vermont, I pledge that I will do my utmost to make sure that the lights <laughs> never go out in America. There you go. Yeah. I pledge that I will do my utmost to make sure that the brightness of America is never dimmed. And I also pledge to do my utmost to see that the founding principles of liberty, free enterprise, and individual opportunity, and the documents that enshrine those, the Declaration of Independence and the U.S. Constitution, are honored for all perpetuity as long as I have the power to do so. Excellent. I think we're going to end on that. I can't imagine any, any other way. So, um, give you, thank you very much. Is there anything else? May, I just, have a, may, yeah, I, just, sure. may I just say that anyone who'd like to learn more oh. about what I'm doing or would like to support yep. my candidacy could kindly go to zupanforsenate.org. Right. That's zupanforsenate.org. <laughs> I don't have $7 million like Senator Sanders. <laughs> Fortunately, I don't need that much in order to defeat him. I just need the fives, the tens, and the twenty-fives from people who would like to see everything that Vermont can be realized in the very near future. That's my pledge. Thank you Thank very much. You. Thank you. It's an honor meeting you. Thank Good you. luck Thank to you. Thank you very much. Thank you all for tuning in. We'll see you next week. And in the meantime, keep listening Beyond the Soundbites. <laughs>